Section 16, Part 3, Chapter 2 of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris. Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly, Part 3, The Civilization of the Old World and New Compared, Chapter 2, The Identity of the Civilizations of the Old World and the New. Mosaics at Mitla, Mexico. Architecture. Plato tells us that the Atlanteans possessed architecture, that they built walls, temples, and palaces. We need not add that this art was found in Egypt and all the civilized countries of Europe, as well as in Peru, Mexico, and Central America. Among both the Peruvians and Egyptians the walls recede inward, and the doors were narrow at the top than at the threshold. The obelisks of Egypt, covered with hieroglyphics, are paralleled by the round columns of Central America, and both are supposed to have originated in phallus worship. The usual symbol of the phallus was an erect stone, often in its rough state, sometimes sculptured, that from Squire, Serpent Symbol, page 49, Bancroft's Native Races, Volume 3, page 504. The worship of Priapus was found in Asia, Egypt, along the European shore of the Mediterranean, and in the forests of Central America. The mounds of Europe and Asia were made in the same way, and for the same purposes as those of America. Herodotus describes the burial of a Scythian king. He says, After this they set to work to raise a vast mound above the grave, all of them vying with each other and seeking to make it as tall as possible. It must be confessed, says Foster, Prehistoric Races, page 193, that these Scythic burial rites have a strong resemblance to those of the mound builders. Homer describes the erection of a great symmetrical mound over Achilles, also one over Hector. Alexander the Great raised a great mound over his friend Hephaestion at a cost of more than a million dollars and Semiramis raised a similar mound over her husband. The pyramids of Egypt, Assyria, and Phoenicia had their duplicates in Mexico and Central America. Carving on the Buddhist Tower, Sarnath, India The grave cysts made of stone of the American mounds are exactly like the stone chests, or Christvain for the dead, found in the British mounds. Foster's Prehistoric Races, page 109 Tumuli have been found in Yorkshire enclosing wooden coffins, precisely as in the mounds of the Mississippi Valley. Ibid, page 185. The articles associated with the dead are the same in both continents. Arms, trinkets, food, clothes, and funeral urns. In both the Mississippi Valley and among the Chaldeans, vases were constructed around the bones, the neck of the vase being too small to permit the extraction of the skull. Foster's Prehistoric Races, page 200. The use of cement was known alike to the European and American nations. The use of the arch was known on both sides of the Atlantic. The manufacture of bricks was known in both the old and the new worlds. The style of ornamentation in architecture was much the same on both hemispheres, as shown in the preceding designs, page 137, page 139. Metallurgy. The Atlanteans mined ores and worked in metals. They used copper, tin, bronze, gold, and silver, and probably iron. The American nations possessed all these metals. The age of bronze, or of copper combined with tin, was preceded in America and nowhere else by a simpler age of copper, and therefore the working of metals probably originated in America, or in some region to which it was tributary. The Mexicans manufactured bronze, and the Incas mined iron near Lake Titicaca and the civilization of this latter region, as we will show, probably dated back to Atlantean times. The Peruvians called gold the tears of the sun. It was sacred to the sun, as silver was sacred to the moon. Sculpture The Atlanteans possessed this art, so did the American and Mediterranean nations. Dr. Arthur Schott, Smith, Rep. 1869, page 391, in describing the Cara Gigantesca, or Gigantic Face, a monument to Yzmal in Yucatan, says, Behind and on both sides, from under the mitre, a short veil falls upon the shoulders, 
so as to protect the back of the head and the neck. This particular appendage vividly calls to mind the same feature in the symbolic adornments of Egyptian and Hindu priests, and even those of the Hebrew hierarchy. Dr. Schott sees in the orbicular wheel-like plates of this statue the wheel symbol of Kronos and Saturn, and in turn it may be supposed that the wheel of Kronos was simply the cross of Atlantis, surrounded by its encircling ring. Painting. This art was known on both sides of the Atlantic. The paintings upon the walls of some of the temples of Central America reveal a state of the art as high as that of Egypt. Engraving. Plato tells us that the Atlanteans engraved upon pillars. The American nations also had this art in common with Egypt, Phoenicia, and Assyria. Agriculture. The people of Atlantis were preeminently an agricultural people. So were the civilized nations of America and the Egyptians. In Egypt the king put his hand to the plow at an annual festival, thus dignifying and consecrating the occupation of husbandry. In Peru precisely the same custom prevailed. In both the plow was known. In Egypt it was drawn by oxen, and in Peru by men. It was drawn by men in the north of Europe down to a comparatively recent period. Public Works The American nations built public works as great as or greater than any known in Europe. The Peruvians had public roads, 1,500 to 2,000 miles long, made so thoroughly as to elicit the astonishment of the Spaniards. At every few miles taverns or hotels were established for the accommodation of travelers. Humboldt pronounced these Peruvian roads among the most useful and stupendous works ever executed by man. They built aqueducts for purposes of irrigation, some of which were five hundred miles long. They constructed magnificent bridges of stone, and had even invented suspension bridges thousands of years before they were introduced into Europe. They had, both in Peru and Mexico, a system of posts, by means of which news was transmitted hundreds of miles in a day, precisely like those known among the Persians in the time of Herodotus, and subsequently among the Romans. Stones similar to milestones were placed along the roads in Peru. See Prescott's Peru. Navigation. Sailing vessels were known to the Peruvians and the Central Americans. Columbus met in 1502 at an island near Honduras, a party of the Mayas in a large vessel equipped with sails and loaded with a variety of textile fabrics of diverse colors. Ancient Irish vase of the Bronze Age. Manufactures. The American nations manufactured woolen and cotton goods. They made pottery as beautiful as the wares of Egypt. They manufactured glass. They engraved gems and precious stones. The Peruvians had such immense numbers of vessels and ornaments of gold that the Inca paid with them a ransom for himself to Pizarro of the value of fifteen million dollars. Music. It's been pointed out that there is a great resemblance between the five-toned music of the Highland Scotch and that of the Chinese and other Eastern nations. Anthropology, page 292. Weapons. The weapons of the New World were identically the same as those of the Old World. They consisted of bows and arrows, spears, darts, short swords, battle-axes, and slings, and both peoples used shields or bucklers, and casks of wood or hide covered with metal. If these weapons had been derived from separate sources of invention, one country or the other would have possessed implements not known to the other, like the blowpipe, the boomerang, etc., Absolute identity in so many weapons strongly argues identity of origin. Religion The religion of the Atlanteans, as Plato tells us, was pure and simple. They made no regular sacrifices, but fruits and flowers. They worshipped the sun. In Peru a single deity was worshipped, and the sun, his most glorious work, was honored as his representative. Quetzalcoatl, the founder of the Aztecs, condemned all sacrifice but that of fruits and flowers. The first religion of Egypt was pure and simple. Its sacrifices were fruits and flowers. Temples were erected to the sun, Ra, throughout Egypt. In Peru the great festival of the sun was called Ra-mi. The Phoenicians worshipped Baal and Moloch. The one represented the beneficent and the other the injurious powers of the sun. Religious Beliefs 
The Guanaches of the Canary Islands, who were probably a fragment of the old Atlantean population, believed in the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body, and preserved their dead as mummies. The Egyptians believed in the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body, and preserved the bodies of the dead by embalming them. The Peruvians believed in the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body, and they too preserved the bodies of their dead by embalming them. A few mummies in remarkable preservation have been found among the Chinooks and Flatheads. That from Schoolcraft, volume 5, page 693. The embalmment of the body was also practiced in Central America and among the Aztecs. The Aztecs, like the Egyptians, mummified their dead by taking out the bowels and replacing them with aromatic substances. Dorman, Origin Prim Superstition, page 173. The bodies of the kings of the Virginia Indians were preserved by embalming. Beverly, page 47. Here are different races, separated by immense distances of land and ocean, uniting in the same beliefs and in the same practical and logical application of those beliefs. The use of confession and penance was known in the religious ceremonies of some of the American nations. Baptism was a religious ceremony with them, and the bodies of the dead were sprinkled with water. Vestal virgins were found in organized communities on both sides of the Atlantic. They were in each case pledged to celibacy, and devoted to death if they violated their vows. In both hemispheres the recreant were destroyed by being buried alive. The Peruvians, Mexicans, Central Americans, Egyptians, Phoenicians, and Hebrews each had a powerful hereditary priesthood. The Phoenicians believed in an evil spirit called Zebub. The Peruvians had a devil called Coupe. The Peruvians burnt incense in their temples. The Peruvians, when they sacrificed animals, examined their entrails, and from those prognosticated the future. I need not add that all these nations preserved traditions of the deluge, and all of them possessed systems of writing. The Egyptian priest of Sais told Solon that the myth of Phaeton, the son of Helios, having attempted to drive the chariot of the sun, and thereby burning up the earth, referred to a declination of the bodies moving round the earth and in the heavens, comets, which caused a great conflagration upon the earth, from which those only escaped who lived near rivers and seas. The Codex Chimalpopoca, a Nahua Central American record, tells us that the third era of the world, or third sun, is called Quiatonatia, or Son of Rain, because in this age there fell a rain of fire, all which existed burned, and there fell a rain of gravel. The rocks boiled with tumult, and there also arose the rocks of vermilion color. In other words, the traditions of these people go back to a great cataclysm of fire, when the earth possibly encountered, as in the Egyptian story, one of the bodies moving round the earth and in the heavens. They had also memories of the drift period, and of the outburst of plutonic rocks. If man has existed on the earth as long as science asserts, he must have passed through many of the great catastrophes that are written upon the face of the planet, and it is very natural that in myths and legends he should preserve some recollection of events so appalling and destructive. Among the early Greeks, Pan was the ancient god, his wife was Maya. The Abbe Brasseur de Bourbourg calls attention to the fact that Pan was adored in all parts of Mexico and Central America, and at Panuco, or Panca, literally Panopolis, the Spaniards found upon their entrance into Mexico superb temples and images of Pan, Brasseur's introduction in Landa's Relacion. The names of both Pan and Maya enter extensively into the Maya vocabulary, Maya being the same as Maya, the principal name of the peninsula, and Pan, added to Maya, makes the name of the ancient capital Mayapan. In the Nahua language, Pan, or Pani, signifies equality to that which is above, and Pentecatl was the progenitor of all beings. North Americans of Antiquity, page 467. The ancient Mexicans believed that the sun god would destroy the world in the last night of the fifty-second year, and that he would never come back. They offered sacrifices to him at that time to propitiate him. They extinguished all the fires in the kingdom. They broke all their household furniture. 
they hung black masks before their faces, they prayed and fasted, and on the evening of the last night they formed a great procession to a neighboring mountain. A human being was sacrificed exactly at midnight. A block of wood was laid at once on the body, and fire was then produced by rapidly revolving another piece of wood upon it. A spark was carried to a funeral pile, whose rising flame proclaimed to the anxious people the promise of the god not to destroy the world for another fifty-two years. Precisely the same custom obtained among the nations of Asia Minor and other parts of the continent of Asia, wherever sun-worship prevailed, at the periodical reproduction of the sacred fire, but not with the same bloody rites as in Mexico. Valentini, Maya Archaeology, page 21. To this day the Brahmin of India churns his sacred fire out of a board by boring into it with a stick. The Romans renewed their sacred fire in the same way, and in Sweden, even now, a need-fire is kindled in this manner, when cholera or other pestilence is about. Tyler's Anthropology, page 262. A belief in ghosts is found on both continents. The American Indians think that the spirits of the dead retain the form and features which they wore while living, that there is a hell and a heaven, that hell is below the earth and heaven above the clouds, that the souls of the wicked sometimes wander the face of the earth, appearing occasionally to mortals. The story of Tantalus is found among the Chippewyans, who believe that bad souls stand up to their chins in water in sight of the spirit land, which they can never enter. The dead passed to heaven across a stream of water by means of a narrow and slippery bridge, from which many were lost. The Zunis set apart a day in each year, which they spent among the graves of their dead, communing with their spirits, and bringing them presents, a kind of All Souls Day. Dorman, Primitive Superstitions, page 35. The Stygian Flood and Scylla and Charybdis are found among the legends of the Caribs. Ibid, page 37. Even the boat of Charon reappears in the traditions of the Chippewyans. The Oriental belief in the transmigration of souls is found in every American tribe. The souls of men passed into animals or other men. Schoolcraft, Volume 1, page 33. The souls of the wicked passed into toads and wild beasts. Dorman, Primitive Superstitions, page 50. Among both the Germans and the American Indians, lycanthropy, or the metamorphosis of men into wolves, was believed in. In British Columbia the men-wolves have often been seen seated around a fire with their wolf hides hung upon sticks to dry. The Irish legend of hunters pursuing an animal which suddenly disappears, whereupon a human being appears in its place, is found among all the American tribes. That timid and harmless animal the hare was, singularly enough, an object of superstitious reverence and fear in Europe, Asia, and America. The ancient Irish killed all the hares they found on May Day among their cattle, believing them to be witches. Caesar gives an account of the horror in which these animals were held by the Britons. The Kalmucks regarded the rabbit with fear and reverence. Divine honors were paid to the hare in Mexico. Wabasso was changed into a white rabbit and canonized in that form. The white bull, Apis, of the Egyptians, reappears in the sacred white buffalo of the Dakotas which was supposed to possess supernatural power, and after death became a god. The white doe of European legend had its representative in the white deer of the Hustatonic Valley, whose death brought misery to the tribe. The transmission of spirits by the laying on of hands and the exorcism of demons were part of the religion of the American tribes. The witches of Scandinavia, who produced tempests by their incantations, are duplicated in America. A Cree sorcerer sold three days of fair weather for one pound of tobacco. The Indian sorcerers around Freshwater Bay kept the winds in leather bags, and disposed of them as they pleased. Among the American Indians it is believed that those who are insane or epileptic are possessed of devils. Tyler, Primitive Cultures, Volume 2, pages 123 to 126. Sickness is caused by evil spirits entering into the sick person. Eastman's Sioux. The spirits of animals are much feared, and their departure out of the body of the invalid is a cause of thanksgiving. 
Thus an Omaha, after an eructation, says, Thank you, animal. Dorman, Primitive Superstitions, page 55. In both continents burnt offerings were sacrificed to the gods. In both continents the priests divined the future from the condition of the internal organs of the man or animal sacrificed. Ibid, pages 214 to 26. In both continents the future was revealed by the flight of birds and by dreams. In Peru and Mexico there were colleges of augurs, as in Rome, who practiced divination by watching the movements and songs of birds. Ibid, page 261. Animals were worshipped in Central America and on the banks of the Nile. The Ojibwes believed that the barking of a fox was ominous of ill. Ibid, page 225. The peasantry of Western Europe have the same belief as to the howling of a dog. The belief in satyrs and other creatures, half man and half animal, survived in America. The Kickapoos are Darwinians. They think their ancestors had tails, and when they lost them, the impudent fox sent every morning to ask how their tails were, and the bear shook his fat sides at the joke. Ibid, page 232. Among the natives of Brazil, the father cut a stick at the wedding of his daughter. This was done to cut off the tails of any future grandchildren. That from Tyler, volume 1, page 384. Jove, with the thunderbolts in his hand, is duplicated in the Mexican god of thunder, Mexcotl, who is represented holding a bundle of arrows. He rode upon a tornado and scattered the lightnings. Dorman, Primitive Superstitions, page 98. The confession of their sins was with a view to satisfy the evil spirit and induce him to leave them. Ibid, page 57. Dionysus, or Bacchus, is represented by the Mexican god Texcatazoncatl, the god of wine. Bancroft, volume 3, page 418. Atlas reappears in Chibchacom, the deity of the Chibchas. He bears the world on his shoulders, and when he shifts the burden from one shoulder to another, Severe earthquakes are produced. Bollert, pages 12 and 13. Deucalion, re-peopling the world, is repeated in Sholalt, who, after the destruction of the world, descended to Mictlan, the realm of the dead, and brought thence a bone of the perished race. This, sprinkled with blood, grew into a youth, the father of the present race. The Kisha hero gods, Hanapu and Shiblank, died. Their bodies were burnt, their bones ground to powder, and thrown into the waters, whereupon they changed into handsome youths with the same features as before. Dorman Primitive Superstitions, page 193. Witches and warlocks, mermaids and mermen, are part of the mythology of the American tribes, as they were of the European races. Ibid, page 79. The mermaid of the Ottawas was woman to the waist and fair, thence fish-like. Ibid, page 278. The snake locks of Medusa are represented in the snake locks of Atotarho, an ancient culture hero of the Iroquois. A belief in the incarnation of gods in men and the physical translation of heroes to heaven is part of the mythology of the Hindus and the American races. Hiawatha, we are told, rose to heaven in the presence of the multitude and vanished from sight in the midst of sweet music. The vocal statues and oracles of Egypt and Greece were duplicated in America. In Peru, in the valley of Rimac, there was an idol which answered questions and became famous as an oracle. Dorman, Primitive Superstitions, page 124. The Peruvians believed that men were sometimes metamorphosed into stones. The Oneidas claimed descent from a stone, as the Greeks from the stones of Deucalion. Ibid, page 132. Witchcraft is an article of faith among all the American races. Among the Illinois Indians, they made small images to represent those whose days they have a mind to shorten, and which they stab to the heart, whereupon the person represented is expected to die. Charlevoix, Volume 2, page 166. The witches of Europe made figures of wax of their enemies, and gradually melted them at the fire, and as they diminished, the victim was supposed to sicken and die. 
A writer in the Popular Science Monthly, April 1881, page 828, points out the fact that there is an absolute identity between the folklore of the Negroes on the plantations of the South and the myths and stories of certain tribes of Indians in South America, as revealed by Mr. Herbert Smith's Brazil, the Amazons, and the Coast, New York, Scribner, 1879. Mr. Harris, the author of a work on the folklore of the Negroes, asks this question. When did the Negro, or the North American Indian, come in contact with the tribes of South America? End of section 16, part 3, chapter 2, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly, recording by Mike Harris. Part Three, Chapter Two of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris. Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly, Section Seventeen, Part Three, Chapter Two. Customs. Both peoples manufactured a fermented, intoxicating drink, the one deriving it from barley, the other from maize. Both drank toasts. Both had the institution of marriage, an important part of the ceremony consisting in the joining of hands. Both recognized divorce, and the Peruvians and Mexicans established special courts to decide cases of this kind. Both the Americans and the Europeans erected arches, and had triumphal processions for their victorious kings, and both strewed the ground before them with leaves and flowers. Both celebrated important events with bonfires and illuminations. Both used banners. Both invoked blessings. The Phoenicians, Hebrews, and Egyptians practiced circumcision. Palacio relates that at Azori in Honduras the natives circumcised boys before an idol called Iselka. Carta, page 84. Lord Kingsborough tells us the Central Americans used the same rite, and Mackenzie, quoted by Retzius, says he saw the ceremony performed by the Chippeways. Both had bards and minstrels who on great festivals sung the deeds of kings and heroes. Both the Egyptians and Peruvians had agricultural fairs. Both took a census of the people. Among both the land was divided per capita among the people. In Judea a new division was made every fifty years. The Peruvians renewed every year all the fires of the kingdom from the Temple of the Sun, the new fire being kindled from concave mirrors by the sun's rays. The Romans under Numa had precisely the same custom. The Peruvians had theatrical plays. They chewed the leaves of the coca mixed with lime, as the Hindu today chews the leaves of the beetle mixed with lime. Both the American and European nations were divided into castes. Both practiced planet worship. Both used scales and weights and mirrors. The Peruvians, Egyptians, and Chaldeans divided the year into twelve months, and the months into lesser divisions of weeks. Both inserted additional days, so as to give the year three hundred and sixty-five days. The Mexicans added five intercalary days, and the Egyptians, in the time of Amnoth I, had already the same practice. Humboldt, whose high authority cannot be questioned, by an elaborate discussion, views the Cordilleras, page 148 at sec, at 1870, has shown the relative likeness of the Nahua calendar to that of Asia. He cites the fact that the Chinese, Japanese, Kalmuks, Mongols, Manchu, and other hordes of Tartars have cycles of sixty years' duration divided into five brief periods of twelve years each. The method of citing a date by means of signs and numbers is quite similar with Asiatics and Mexicans. He further shows satisfactorily that the majority of the names of the twenty days employed by the Aztecs are those of a zodiac used since the most remote antiquity among the peoples of eastern Asia. Cabrera thinks he finds analogies between the Mexican and Egyptian calendars, Adopting the view of several writers that the Mexican year began on the 26th of February, 
he finds the date to correspond with the beginning of the Egyptian year. The American nations believed in four great primeval ages, as the Hindu does to this day. In the Greeks of Homer, says Volney, I find the customs, discourse, and manners of the Iroquois, Delaware, and Miamis. The tragedies of Sophocles and Euripides paint to me almost literally the sentiments of the red men respecting necessity, fatality, the miseries of human life, and the rigor of blind destiny. Volney's view of the United States. The Mexicans represent an eclipse of the moon as the moon being devoured by a dragon, and the Hindus have precisely the same figure. And both nations continued to use this expression long after they had discovered the real meaning of an eclipse. The Tartars believe that if they cut with an axe near a fire, or stick a knife into a burning stick, or touch the fire with a knife, they will cut the top off the fire. The Sioux Indians will not stick an awl or a needle into a stick of wood on the fire, or chop on it with an axe or a knife. Cremation was extensively practiced in the New World. The dead were burnt and their ashes collected and placed in vases and urns, as in Europe. Wooden statues of the dead were made. There is a very curious and apparently inexplicable custom, called the Couvade, which extends from China to the Mississippi Valley. It demands that when a child is born the father must take to his bed while the mother attends to all the duties of the household. Marco Polo found the custom among the Chinese in the thirteenth century. The widow tells Hudibras, Chineses thus are said to lie in their lady's stead. The practice remarked by Marco Polo continues to this day among the hill tribes of China. The father of a newborn child, as soon as the mother has become strong enough to leave her couch, gets into bed himself, and there receives the congratulations of his acquaintances. Max Muller's Chips from a German Workshop, Volume 2, page 272. Strabo, Volume 3, page 4 and 17, mentions that among the Iberians of the north of Spain, the women after the birth of a child tend their husbands, putting them to bed instead of going themselves. The same custom existed among the Basques only a few years ago. In Biscay, says M. F. Michel, the women rise immediately after childbirth and attend to the duties of the household, while the husband goes to bed taking the baby with him, and thus receives the neighbor's compliments. The same custom was found in France, and is said to exist to this day, in some cantons of Bern. Diodorus Siculus tells us that among the Corsicans the wife was neglected, and the husband put to bed and treated as the patient. Apollonius Rhodius says that among the Tiberini, at the south of the Black Sea, when a child was born the father lay groaning with his head tied up, while the mother tended him with food and prepared his baths. The same absurd custom extends throughout the tribes of North and South America. Among the Caribs in the West Indies, and the Caribs, Brasseur de Bourbourg says, were the same as the ancient Carrions of the Mediterranean Sea, the man takes to his bed as soon as a child is born and kills no animals. And herein we find an explanation of a custom otherwise inexplicable. Among the American Indians, it is believed that if the father kills an animal during the infancy of the child, the spirit of the animal will revenge itself by inflicting some disease upon the helpless little one. For six months after the Carib father must not eat birds or fish, for whatever animals he eats will impress their likeness on the child, or produce disease by entering its body. Dorman, Primitive Superstitions, page 58. Among the Abipones, the husband goes to bed, fasts a number of days, and you would think, says Dobritzboffer, that it was he that had had the child. The Brazilian father takes to his hammock during and after the birth of the child, and for fifteen days eats no meat and hunts no game. Among the Eskimos the husbands forbear hunting during the lying in of their wives, and for some time thereafter. Here, then, we have a very extraordinary and unnatural custom existing to this day on both sides of the Atlantic, reaching back to a vast antiquity, and finding its explanation only in the superstition of the American races. A practice so absurd would scarcely have originated separately in the two continents. Its existence is a very strong proof of unity of origin of the races 
on the opposite sides of the Atlantic. And the fact that the custom and the reason for it are both found in America, while the custom remains in Europe without the reason, would imply that the American population was the older of the two. The Indian practice of depositing weapons and food with the dead was universal in ancient Europe, and in German villages nowadays a needle and thread is placed in the coffin for the dead to mend their torn clothes with, while all over Europe the dead man has a piece of money put in his hand to pay his way with. Anthropology, page 347. The American Indian leaves food with the dead, the Russian peasant puts crumbs of bread behind the saint's pictures on the little iron shelf, and believes that the souls of his forefathers creep in and out and eat them. At the cemetery of Père Lachaise in Paris, on Old Souls' Day, they still put cakes and sweetmeats on the graves, and in Brittany the peasants that night do not forget to make up the fire, and leave the fragments of the supper on the table for the souls of the dead. Ibid, page 351. The Indian prays to the spirits of his forefathers. The Chinese religion is largely ancestor worship, and the rites paid to the dead ancestors, or lares, held the Roman family together. Anthropology, page 351. We find the Indian practice of burying the dead in a sitting posture in use among the Nasimonians, tribe of Libyans. Herodotus, speaking of the wandering tribes of northern Africa, says, They bury their dead according to the fashion of the Greeks, they bury them sitting, and are right careful when the sick man is at the point of giving up the ghost to make him sit and not let him die lying down. The dead bodies of the Kaikiks of Bogota were protected from desecration by diverting the course of a river and making the grave in its bed and then letting the stream return to its natural course. Alaric, the leader of the Goths, was secretly buried in the same way. Dorman, Primitive Superstition, page 195. Among the American tribes, no man is permitted to marry a wife of the same clan name or totem as himself. In India, a Brahmin is not allowed to marry a wife whose clan name, her cow stall, as they say, is the same as his own, nor may a Chinaman take a wife of his own surname. Anthropology, page 403. Throughout India, the hill tribes are divided into septs, or clans, and a man may not marry a woman belonging to his own clan. The Kalmuks of Tartary are divided into hordes, and a man may not marry a girl of his own horde. The same custom prevails among the Circassians and the Samoyeds of Siberia, and Ostyaks and Yakuts regard it as a crime to marry a woman of the same family, or even of the same name. Sir John Lubbock Smith Rep., page 347, 1869. Sotism, the burning of the widow upon the funeral pile of the husband, was extensively practiced in America, West's Journal, page 141, as was also the practice of sacrificing warriors, servants, and animals at the funeral of a great chief. Dorman, pages 210 to 11. Beautiful girls were sacrificed to appease the anger of the gods, as among the Mediterranean races. Bancroft, volume 3, page 471. Fathers offered up their children for a like purpose, as among the Carthaginians. The poisoned arrows of America had their representatives in Europe. Odysseus went to Ephyra for the man-slaying drug with which to smear his bronze-tipped arrows. Tyler's Anthropology, page 237. The bark canoe of America was not unknown in Asia and Africa. Ibid, page 254 while the skin canoes of our Indians and the Eskimos were found on the shores of the Thames and the Euphrates. In Peru and on the Euphrates, commerce was carried on upon rafts supported by inflated skins. They are still used on the Tigris. The Indian boils his meat by dropping red-hot stones into a water vessel made of hide, and Linnaeus found the both-land people brewing beer in this way, and to this day the rude Corinthian boor drinks such stone beer, as it's called. Ibid, page 266. In the buffalo dance of the Mandan Indians, the dancers covered their heads with a mask made of the head and horns of the buffalo. Today in the temples of India, or among the lamas of Tibet, the priests danced the demons out, or the new year in arrayed in animal masks. 
Ibid, page 297, and the mummers at Yuletide in England are a survival of the same custom. Ibid, page 298. The North American dog and bear dances, wherein the dancers acted the parts of those animals, had their prototype in the Greek dances at the festivals of Dionysia. Ibid, page 298. Tattooing was practiced in both continents. Among the Indians it was fetishistic in its origin. Every Indian had the image of an animal tattooed on his breast or arm to charm away evil spirits. Dorman, Primitive Superstitions, page 156. The sailors of Europe and America preserve to this day a custom which was once universal among the ancient races. Banners, flags, and armorial bearings are supposed to be survivals of the old totemic tattooing. The Arab woman still tattoos her face, arms, and ankles. The war-paint of the American savage reappeared in the woad with which the ancient Briton stained his body, and Tyler suggests that the painted stripes on the circus clown are a survival of a custom once universal. Tyler's Anthropology, page 327. In America, as in the Old World, the temples of worship were built over the dead. Dorman, Primitive Superstitions, page 178. Says Prudentius, the Roman bard, they were as many temples as gods as sepulchres. The Etruscan belief that evil spirits strove for the possession of the dead was found among the Mosquito Indians. Bancroft, Native Races, Volume 1, page 744. The belief in fairies, which forms so large a part of the folklore of Western Europe, is found among the American races. The Ojibways see thousands of fairies dancing in a sunbeam. During a rain, myriads of them bide in the flowers. When disturbed, they disappear underground. They have their dances, like the Irish fairies, and, like them, they kill the domestic animals of those who offend them. The Dakotas also believe in fairies. The Otos located the little people in a mound at the mouth of Whitestone River. They were eighteen inches high, with very large heads. They were armed with bows and arrows, and killed those who approached their residence. See Dorman's Origin of Primitive Superstitions, page 23. The Shoshone legends people the mountains of Montana with little imps, called Nirumbees, two feet long, naked, and with a tail. They stole the children of the Indians, and left in their stead the young of their own baneful race, who resembled the stolen children so much that the mothers were deceived and suckled them, whereupon they died. This greatly resembles the European belief in changelings. Ibid, page 24. In both continents we find tree-worship. In Mexico and Central America, cypresses and palms were planted near the temples, generally in groups of threes. They were tended with great care and received offerings of incense and gifts. The same custom prevailed among the Romans. The cypress was dedicated to Pluto and the palm to victory. Not only infant baptism by water was found both in the old Babylonian religion and among the Mexicans, but an offering of cakes, which is recorded by the prophet Jeremiah as part of the worship of the Babylonian goddess-mother, the Queen of Heaven, was also found in the ritual of the Aztecs. Builders of Babel, page 78. In Babylonia, China, and Mexico, the caste at the bottom of the social scale lived upon floating islands of reeds or rafts, covered with earth on the lakes and rivers. In Peru and Babylonia, Marriages were made but once a year at a public festival. Among the Romans, the Chinese, the Abyssinians, and the Indians of Canada, the singular custom prevails of lifting the bride over the doorstep of her husband's home. Sir John Lubbock, Smith, Rep., 1869, page 352. The bride cake, which so invariably accompanies a wedding among ourselves, and which must always be cut by the bride, may be traced back to the old Roman form of marriage by conferiatio, or eating together. So also among the Iroquois, the bride and bridegroom used to partake together of a cake of sagamite, which the bride always offered to her husband. Ibid. Among many American tribes, notably in Brazil, the husband captured the wife by main force, as the men of Benjamin carried off the daughters of Shiloh at the feast, and as the Romans captured the Sabine women. Within a few generations the same old habit was kept up in Wales, where the bridegroom and his friends, mounted and armed as for war, carried off the bride, 
and in Ireland they used even to hurl spears at the bride's people, though at such a distance that no one was hurt, except now and then by accident, as happened when one Lord Hoth lost an eye, which mischance put an end to this curious relic of antiquity. That from Taylor's Anthropology, page 409. Marriage in Mexico was performed by the priest. He exhorted them to maintain peace and harmony, and tied the end of the man's mantle to the dress of the woman. He perfumed them and placed on each a shawl on which was painted a skeleton, as a symbol that only death could now separate them from one another. Dorman Primitive Superstitions, page 379. The priesthood was thoroughly organized in Mexico and Peru. They were prophets as well as priests. They brought the newly born infant into the religious society. They directed their training and education. They determined the entrance of the young men into the service of the state. They consecrated marriage by their blessing. They comforted the sick and assisted the dying. Ibid, page 374. There were five thousand priests in the temples of Mexico. They confessed and absolved the sinners, arranged the festivals, and managed the choirs in the churches. They lived in conventual discipline, but were allowed to marry. They practiced flagellation and fasting, and prayed at regular hours. There were great preachers and exhorters among them. There were also convents into which females were admitted. The novice had her hair cut off and took vows of celibacy. They lived holy and pious lives. Ibid, pages 375-376. The king was the high priest of the religious orders. A new king ascended the temple naked except his girdle. He was sprinkled four times with water, which had been blessed. He was then clothed in a mantle, and on his knees took an oath to maintain the ancient religion. The priests then instructed him in his royal duties. Ibid, page 378. Besides the regular priesthood, there were monks who were confined in cloisters. Ibid, page 390. Cortes says the Mexican priests were very strict in the practice of honesty and chastity, and any deviation was punished with death. They wore long white robes and burned incense. Dorman Primitive Superstitions, page 379. The first fruits of the earth were devoted to the support of the priesthood. Ibid, page 383. The priests of the Isthmus were sworn to perpetual chastity. The American doctors practiced phlebotomy. They bled the sick because they believed the evil spirit which afflicted him would come away with the blood. In Europe, phlebotomy only continued to a late period, but the original superstition out of which it arose, in this case, as in many others, was forgotten. There is opportunity here for the philosopher to meditate upon the perversity of human nature and the persistence of hereditary error. The superstition of one age becomes the science of another. Men were first bled to withdraw the evil spirit, then to cure the disease, and a practice whose origin is lost in the night of ages is continued into the midst of civilization, and only overthrown after it has sent millions of human beings to untimely graves. Dr. Sangrado could have found the explanation of his profession only among the red men of America folklore. Says Max Muller, not only do we find the same words and the same terminations in Sanskrit and Gothic, not only do we find the same name for Zeus in Sanskrit, Latin, and German, not only is the abstract name for God the same in India, Greece, and Italy, but these very stories, these Märchen, which nurses still tell with almost the same words in the Thuringian forest and in the Norwegian villages, and to which crowds of children listen under the pipple trees of India. These stories, too, belong to the common heirloom of the Indo-European race, and their origin carries us back to the same distant past, when no Greek has set foot in Europe, no Hindu had bathed in the sacred waters of the Ganges. And we find that an identity of origin can be established between the folklore or fairy tales of America and those of the Old World, precisely such as exists between the legends of Norway and India. Mr. Taylor tells us the story of the two brothers in Central America, who, starting on their dangerous journey to the land of Shibalba, where their father had perished, plant each a cane in the middle of their grandmother's house, that she may know by its flourishing or withering whether they are alive or dead. Exactly the same conception occurs in Grimm's Märchen, when the two gold children 
wish to see the world and to leave their father, and when their father is sad and asks them how he shall bear news of them, they tell him, We leave you the two golden lilies, from these you can see how we fare. If they are fresh, we are well. If they fade, we are ill. If they fall, we are dead. Grimm traces the same idea in Hindu stories. Now this, says Max Müller, is strange enough, and its occurrence in India, Germany, and Central America is stranger still. Compare the following stories, which we print in parallel columns, one from the Ojibwe Indians and the other from Ireland. The Ojibwe story goes, the birds met together one day to try which could fly the highest. Some flew up very swift, but soon got tired, and were passed by others of stronger wing, but the eagle went up beyond them all, and was ready to claim the victory, when the gray linnet, a very small bird, flew from the eagle's back, where it had perched unperceived, and, being fresh and unexhausted, succeeded in going the highest. When the birds came down and met in council to award the prize, it was given to the eagle, because that bird had not only gone up nearer to the sun than any of the larger birds, but it had carried the linnet on its back. For this reason the eagle's feathers became the most honorable marks of distinction a warrior could bear. Now the Irish story goes, The birds all met together one day, and settled among themselves that whichever of them could fly highest was to be the king of all. Well, just as they were on the hinges of being off, what does the little rogue of a wren do but hop up and perch himself unbeknownst on the eagle's tail? So they flew and flew ever so high, till the eagle was miles above all the rest, and could not fly another stroke, he was so tired. Then, says he, I am the king of the birds. You lie, says the wren, darting up a perch and a half above the big fellow. Well, the eagle was so mad to think how he was done, that when the wren was coming down he gave him a stroke of his wing, and from that day to this... The wren was never able to fly farther than a hawthorn bush. And then compare these two stories. The Asiatic story. In Hindu mythology, Urvasi came down from heaven and became the wife of the son of Buddha, only on condition that two pet rams should never be taken from her bedside, and that she should never behold her lord undressed. The immortals, however, wishing Urvasi back in heaven, contrived to steal the rams, and, as the king pursued the robbers with his sword in the dark, the lightning revealed his person, the compact was broken, and Urvasi disappeared. This same story is found in different forms among many people of Aryan and Turanian descent, the central idea being that of a man marrying someone of an aerial or aquatic origin, and living happily with her till he breaks the condition on which her residence with him depends stories exactly parallel to that of Raymond of Toulouse, who chances in the hunt upon the beautiful Melusina at a fountain, and lives with her happily until he discovers her fish nature, and she vanishes. Now, the American story. Wampi, a great hunter, once came to a strange prairie, where he heard faint sounds of music, and, looking up, saw a speck in the sky, which proved itself to be a basket containing twelve most beautiful maidens, who on reaching the earth forthwith set themselves to dance. He tried to catch the youngest, but in vain. Ultimately he succeeded by assuming the disguise of a mouse. He was very attentive to his new wife, who was really a daughter of one of the stars, but she wished to return home, so she made a wicker basket secretly, and, by help of a charm, she remembered, ascended to her father. If the legend of Cadmus recovering Europa after she has been carried away by the white bull, the spotless cloud, means that the sun must journey westward until he sees again the beautiful tints which greeted his eyes in the morning. It's curious to find a story current in North America to the effect that a man once had a beautiful daughter, whom he forbade to leave the lodge lest she should be carried off by the king of the buffaloes, and that as she sat notwithstanding outside the house combing her hair, all of a sudden the king of the buffaloes came dashing on with his herd of followers, and, taking her between his horns, away he cantered over plains, plunged into a river which bounded his land, and carried her safely to his lodge on the other side, whence she was finally recovered by her father. Games The same games and sports extended from India to the shores of Lake Superior. 
the game of the Hindus, called Pachisi, is played upon a cross-shaped board or cloth. It's a combination of checkers and drops, with the throwing of dice, the dice determining the number of moves. When the Spaniards entered Mexico, they found the Aztecs playing the game, called Patoli, identical with the Hindu Pachisi, on a similar cross-shaped board. The game of ball, which the Indians of America were in the habit of playing at the time of the discovery of the country from California to the Atlantic, was identical with the European chueca, cross, or hockey. One may well pause after reading this catalogue and ask himself, wherein do these people differ? It's absurd to pretend that all these similarities could have been the result of accidental coincidence. These two people, separated by the great ocean, were baptized alike in infancy with blessed water, they prayed alike to the gods, they worshipped together the sun, moon, and stars, they confessed their sins alike, they were instructed alike by an established priesthood, they were married in the same way and by the joining of hands, they armed themselves with the same weapons, when children came, the man on both continents went to bed and left his wife to do the honors of the household, they tattooed and painted themselves in the same fashion, they became intoxicated on kindred drinks, their dresses were alike, they cooked in the same manner, they used the same metals, they employed the same exorcisms and bleedings for disease, they believed alike in ghosts, demons, and fairies, they listened to the same stories, they played the same games, they used the same musical instruments, they danced the same dances, and when they died they were embalmed in the same way and buried sitting while over them were erected on both continents the same mounds, pyramids, obelisks, and temples. And yet we are asked to believe that there was no relationship between them, and that they had never had any anti-Columbian intercourse with each other. If our knowledge of Atlantis was more thorough, it would no doubt appear that, in every instance wherein the people of Europe accord with the people of America, they were both in accord with the people of Atlantis, and that Atlantis was the common center from which both peoples derived their arts, sciences, customs, and opinions. It will be seen that in every case where Plato gives us any information in this respect as to Atlantis, we find this agreement to exist. It existed in architecture, sculpture, navigation, engraving, writing, an established priesthood, the mode of worship, agriculture, the construction of roads and canals, and it's reasonable to suppose that the same correspondence extended down to all the minor details treated of in this chapter. End of section 17, part 3, chapter 2. Atlantis, the Antediluvian World by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Recording by Mike Harris. Section 18, Part 3, Chapter 3 of Atlantis, The Antediluvian World by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet, Atlantis, The Antediluvian World by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Chapter 3 American Evidences of Intercourse with Europe or Atlantis 1. On the monuments of Central America there are representations of bearded men. How could the beardless American Indians have imagined a bearded race? 2. All the traditions of the civilized races of Central America point to an Eastern origin. The leader and civilizer of the Nahua family was Quetzalcoatl. This is the legend respecting him. From the distant east, from the fabulous Huhu Tlapalan, this mysterious person came to Tula and became the patron god and high priest of the ancestors of the Toltecs. He is described as having been a white man with strong formation of body, broad forehead, large eyes, and flowing beard. He wore a mitre on his head and was dressed in a long white robe reaching to his feet and covered with red crosses. In his hand he held a sickle. 
his habits were ascetic, he never married, was most chaste and pure in life, and is said to have endured penance in a neighboring mountain, not for its effects upon himself, but as a warning to others. He condemned sacrifices, except of fruits and flowers, and was known as the god of peace. For, when addressed on the subject of war, he is reported to have stopped his ears with his fingers. The North Americans of antiquity, he was skilled in many arts, he invented, that is, imported, gem-cutting and metal-casting. He originated letters and invented the Mexican calendar. He finally returned to the land in the east from which he came. Leaving the American coast at Veracruz, he embarked in a canoe made of serpent skins and sailed away into the east. Ibid, page 271. Dr. Le Plongeon says of the columns at Chichen, The base is formed by the head of Kukulkan, the shaft of the body of the serpent, with its feathers beautifully carved to the very chapiter. On the chapiters of the columns that support the portico, at the entrance of the castle in Chichen Itza, may be seen the carved figures of long-bearded men with upraised hands in the act of worshipping sacred trees. They forcibly recall to mind the same worship in Assyria. In the accompanying cut of an ancient vase from Tula, we see a bearded figure grasping a beardless man. In the cut given below, we see a face that might be duplicated among the old men of any part of Europe. The Kakshikwal MS says, Four persons came from Tulan, from the direction of the rising sun, that is one Tulan. There is another Tulan in Xibal Bay, and another where the sun sets, and it is there that we came. And in the direction of the setting sun, there is another, where is the god, so that there are four Tulans. And it is where the sun sets that we came to Tulan, from the other side of the sea, where this Tulan is. And it is there that we were conceived and begotten by our mothers and fathers. That is to say, the birthplace of the race was in the east, across the sea, at a place called Tulan, and when they emigrated they called their first stopping place on the American continent Tulan also, and besides this, there were two other Tulans. Of the Nahua predecessors of the Toltecs in Mexico, the Olmecs and Xicalaucans were the most important. They were the forerunners of the great races that followed. According to Ixlisochitl, these people, which are conceded to be one, occupied the world in the Third Age. They came from the east in ships or barks to the land of Potonchan, which they commenced to populate. 3. The Abbé Brasseur de Bourbourg, in one of the notes of the introduction of the Popol Vuh, presents a very remarkable analogy between the kingdom of Xibalba, described in that work, and Atlantis. He says, Both countries are magnificent, exceedingly fertile, and abound in the precious metals. The empire of Atlantis was divided into ten kingdoms, governed by five couples of twin sons of Poseidon, the eldest being supreme over the others, and the ten constituted a tribunal that managed the affairs of the empire. Their descendants governed after them. The ten kings of Xibalba, who reigned, in couples, under Hunkame and Vukubkame, and who together constituted a grand council of the kingdom, certainly furnish curious points of comparison. And there is wanting neither a catastrophe, for Xibalba had a terrific inundation, nor the name of Atlas, of which the etymology is found only in the Nahuatlan tongue. It comes from Adel, water, and we know that a city of Atlan, near the water, still existed on the Atlantic side of the Isthmus of Panama at the time of the conquest. In Yucatan the traditions all point to an eastern and foreign origin for the race. The early writers report that the natives believed their ancestors to have crossed the sea by a passage which was open for them. Lendas Relacion, page 28. It was also believed that part of the population came into the country from the west. Lisana says that the smaller portion, the little descent, came from the east, while the greater portion, the great descent, came from the west. Kogoluda considers the eastern colony to have been the larger. The culture hero Zamna, the author of all civilization in Yucatan, 
is described as the teacher of letters and the leader of the people from their ancient home, he was the leader of a colony from the East. The North Americans of Antiquity, page 229. The ancient Mexican legends say that, after the flood, Coxcox and his wife, after wandering one hundred and four years, landed at Antlan, and passed thence to Capultepec, and thence to Culhuacan, and lastly to Mexico. Coming from Atlantis, they named their first landing place Antlan. All the races that settled Mexico, we are told, traced their origin back to an Aztlan, Atlantis. Duran describes Aztlan as a most attractive land. The North Americans of Antiquity, page 257. Same, the great name of Brazilian legend, came across the ocean from the rising sun. He had power over the elements and tempests. The trees of the forest would recede to make room for him, cutting down the trees. The animals used to crouch before him, domesticated animals. Lakes and rivers became solid for him boats and bridges, and he taught the use of agriculture and magic. Like him, Bochica, the great lawgiver of the Moiscas, and son of the sun, he who invented for them the calendar and regulated their festivals, had a white beard, a detail in which all the American culture heroes agree. The Sami of Brazil was probably the Samna of Yucatan. 4. We find in America numerous representations of the elephant. We are forced to one of two conclusions. Either the monuments date back to the time of the mammoth in North America, or these people held intercourse at some time in the past with the races who possessed the elephant, and from whom they obtained pictures of that singular animal. Plato tells us that the Atlanteans possessed great numbers of elephants. There are in Wisconsin a number of mounds of earth representing different animals, men, birds, and quadrupeds. Among the latter is a mound representing an elephant, so perfect in its proportions and complete in its representation of an elephant, that its builders must have been well acquainted with all the physical characteristics of the animal which they delineated. We copy the representation of this mound on page 168. On a farm in Louisa County, Iowa, a pipe was ploughed up which also represents an elephant. We are indebted to the valuable work of John T. Short, The North Americans of Antiquity, page 530, for a picture of this singular object. It was found in a section where the ancient mounds were very abundant and rich in relics. The pipe is of sandstone, of the ordinary mound builder's type, and has every appearance of age and usage. There can be no doubt of its genuineness. The finder had no conception of its archaeological value. In the ruined city of Palenque we find, in one of the palaces, a stucco bas-relief of a priest. His elaborate headdress or helmet represents very faithfully the head of an elephant. The cut on page 169 is from a drawing made by Waldeck. The decoration known as elephant trunks is found in many parts of the ancient ruins of Central America, projecting from above the doorways of the buildings. In Tyler's Researches into the Early History of Mankind, page 313, I find a remarkable representation of an elephant taken from an ancient Mexican manuscript. It is as follows. End of chapter 3《Section 19 of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris.《 Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Part 3. The Civilization of the Old World and New Compared. Chapter 4, Section 19. Corroborating Circumstances. 1. Lenormont insists that the human race issued from Ups Meru, and adds that some Greek traditions point to this locality, particularly the expression Me Oropsa, Nau Poi, which can only mean the men sprung from Meru. Manual, page 21. 
Theopompus tells us that the people who inhabited Atlantis were the Meropes, the people of Meru. 2. Whence comes the word Atlantic? The dictionaries tell us that the ocean is named after the mountains of Atlas. But whence did the Atlas mountains get their name? The words Atlas and Atlantic have no satisfactory etymology in any language known to Europe. They are not Greek, and cannot be referred to any known language of the Old World. But in the Nautil language, we find immediately the radical A, Atl, which signifies water, war, and the top of the head. Molina, Vocabulary and Lingua Mexicana y Castellana. From this comes a series of words, such as Atlan, on the border of or amid the water, from which we have the adjective Atlantic. We have also Atlaca, to combat, or Atlasa, or be in agony. It means likewise to hurl or dart from the water, and in the pre makes Atlas. A city named Atlan existed when the continent was discovered by Columbus at the entrance of the Gulf of Uraba in Darien, with a good harbor, it is now reduced to an unimportant pueblo named Acla. This from Baldwin's Ancient America, page 179. Plato tells us that Atlantis and the Atlantic Ocean were named after Atlas, the eldest son of Poseidon, the founder of the kingdom. 3. Upon that part of the African continent nearest to the site of Atlantis, we find a chain of mountains known from the most ancient times as the Atlas Mountains. Whence this name Atlas, if it be not from the name of the great king of Atlantis? And if this be not its origin, how comes it that we find it in the most northwestern corner of Africa? And how does it happen that in the time of Herodotus there dwelt near this mountain chain a people called the Atlantis, probably a remnant of a colony from Solon's island, how comes it that the people of the Barbary states were known to the Greeks, Romans, and Carthaginians as the Atlantes, this name being especially applied to the inhabitants of Fezan and Bilma? Where did they get the name from? There is no etymology for it east of the Atlantic Ocean. Dunormont's Ancient History of the East, page 253. Look at it. An Atlas mountain on the shore of Africa, an Atlan town on the shore of America, the Atlantis living along the north and west coast of Africa, an Aztec people from Aztlan in Central America, an ocean rolling between the two worlds called the Atlantic, a mythological deity called Atlas holding the world on his shoulders, and an immemorial tradition of an island of Atlantis. Can all these things be the result of accident? 4. Plato says that there was a passage west from Atlantis to the rest of the islands, as well as from these islands to the whole opposite continent that surrounds the real sea. He calls it a real sea, as contradistinguished from the Mediterranean, which, as he says, is not a real sea or ocean, but a landlocked body of water like a harbor. Now, Plato might have created Atlantis out of his imagination, but how could he have invented the islands beyond the West India Islands? and the whole continent, America, enclosing that real sea. If we look at the map, we see that the continent of America does surround the ocean in a great half-circle. Could Plato have guessed all this? If there had been no Atlantis, and no series of voyages from it that revealed the half-circle of the continent from Newfoundland to Cape St. Roche, how could Plato have guessed it? And how could he have known that the Mediterranean was only a harbor, compared with the magnitude of the great ocean surrounding Atlantis. Long sea voyages were necessary to establish that fact, and the Greeks, who kept close to the shores in their short journeys, did not make such voyages. 5. How can we, without Atlantis, explain the presence of the Basques in Europe, who have no lingual affinities with any other race on the continent of Europe, but whose language is similar to the languages of America? Plato tells us that the dominion of Gadierius, one of the kings of Atlantis, extended toward the pillars of Heracles, Hercules, as far as the country which is still called the region of Gads in that part of the world. Gadis is the Cadiz of today, and the dominion of Gadierius 
embraced the land of the Iberians, or Basques, their chief city taking its name from a king of Atlantis, and they themselves being Atlanteans. Dr. Farrar, referring to the Basque language, says, What is certain about it is that its structure is polysynthetic, like the languages of America. Like them, it forms its compounds by the elimination of certain radicals in the simple words, so that Ilhon, the twilight, is contracted from Hill, dead, and Egon, day, and Belhar, the knee, from Belhar, front, and Oin, leg. The fact is indisputable, and is eminently noteworthy, that while the affinities of the Basque roots have never been conclusively elucidated, there has never been any doubt that this isolated language, preserving its identity in a western corner of Europe, between two mighty kingdoms, resembles in its grammatical structure the aboriginal languages of the vast opposite continent, America, and those alone. Families of Speech, page 132. If there was an Atlantis, forming with its connecting ridges, a continuous bridge of land from America to Africa, we can understand how the Basques could have passed from one continent to another. But if the wide Atlantic rolled at all times unbroken between the two continents, it is difficult to conceive of such an emigration by an uncivilized people. 6. Without Atlantis, how can we explain the fact that the early Egyptians were depicted by themselves as red men on their own monuments? And, on the other hand, how can we account for the representations of Negroes on the monuments of Central America? Desiree Charnay, now engaged in exploring those monuments, has published in the North American Review for December 1880 photographs of a number of idols exhumed at San Juan de Teotihuacan, from which I select the following strikingly Negroid faces. Negro Idols Found in Mexico Dr. Le Plungion says, Besides the sculptures of long-bearded men seen by the explorer at Chichen Itza, there were tall figures of people with small heads, thick lips, and curly short hair, or wool, regarded as Negroes. We always see them as standard or parasol bearers, but never engaged in actual warfare. Maya Archaeology, page 62. The following cut is from the court of the palace of Palenque, figured by Stevens. The face is strongly Ethiopian. The figure below represents a gigantic granite head found near the volcano of Tuxtla in the Mexican state of Veracruz at Caxapa. The features are unmistakably Negroid. As the Negroes have never been a seafaring race, the presence of these faces among the antiquities of Central America proves one of two things. Either the existence of a land connection between America and Africa via Atlantis, as revealed by the deep-sea soundings of the Challenger, or commercial relations between America and Africa through the ships of the Atlanteans, or some other civilized race, whereby the Negroes were brought to America as slaves at a very remote epoch. And we find some corroboration of the latter theory in that singular book of the Quiches, the Popol Vuh, in which, after describing the creation of the first men, in the region of the rising sun, Bancroft's Native Races, volume 5, page 548, and enumerating their first generations, we are told, all seem to have spoken one language, and to have lived in great peace, black men and white together. Here they awaited the rising of the sun, and prayed to the heart of heaven. Bancroft's Native Races, page 547. How did the red men of Central America know anything about black men and white men? The conclusion seems inevitable that these legends of a primitive, peaceful, and happy land, an Aztlan in the east, inhabited by black and white men, to which all the civilized nations of America traced their origin, could only refer to Atlantis, that bridge of land where the white, dark, and red races met. The Popol Vuh proceeds to tell how this first home of the race became overpopulous, and how the people under Balam Kitse migrated how their language became confounded, in other words, broken up into dialects, in consequence of separation, and how some of the people went to the east, and many came hither to Guatemala. Ibid, page 547. M. A. de Quatrefages, Human Species, page 200, says, 
black populations have been found in America in very small numbers only, as isolated tribes in the midst of very different populations. Such are the Charuas of Brazil, the black Caribbees of St. Vincent in the Gulf of Mexico, the Jamasi of Florida, and the dark-complexioned Californians, such again as the tribe that Balboa saw some representatives of in his passage of the Isthmus of Darien in 1513. They were true Negroes. 7. How comes it that all the civilizations of the Old World radiate from the shores of the Mediterranean? The Mediterranean is a cul-de-sac, with Atlantis opposite its mouth. Every civilization on its shores possesses the traditions that point to Atlantis. We hear of no civilization coming to the Mediterranean from Asia, Africa, or Europe, from north, south, or west. But north, south, east, and west, we find civilization radiating from the Mediterranean to other lands. We see the Aryans descending upon Hindustan from the direction of the Mediterranean, and we find the Chinese borrowing inventions from Hindustan, and claiming descent from a region not far from the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has been the center of the modern world, because it lay in the path of the extension of an older civilization, whose ships colonized its shores, as they did also the shores of America. Plato says, The nations are gathered around the shores of the Mediterranean like frogs around a marsh. Dr. McCausland says, The obvious conclusion from these facts is that at some time previous to these migrations, a people speaking a language of a superior and complicated structure broke up their society, and, under some strong impulse, poured out in different directions, and gradually established themselves in all the lands now inhabited by the Caucasian race. Their territories extend from the Atlantic to the Ganges, and from Iceland to Ceylon, and are bordered on the north and east by the Asiatic Mongols, and on the south by the Negro tribes of Central Africa. They present all the appearances of a later race, expanding itself between and into the territories of two pre-existing neighboring races, and forcibly appropriating the room required for its increasing population. McCausland's Adam and the Adamites, page 280. Modern civilization is Atlantean. Without the thousands of years of development which were had in Atlantis, modern civilization could not have existed. The inventive faculty of the present age is taking up the great delegated work of creation, where Atlantis left it thousands of years ago. 8. How are we to explain the existence of the Semitic race in Europe without Atlantis? It's an intrusive race, a race colonized on sea-coasts. Where are its old-world affinities? 9. Why is it that the origin of wheat, barley, oats, maize, and rye the essential plants of civilization, is totally lost in the mists of a vast antiquity. We have in the Greek mythology legends of the introduction of most of these by Atlantean kings or gods into Europe. But no European nation claims to have discovered or developed them, and it has been impossible to trace them to their wild originals. Out of the whole flora of the world, mankind in the last seven thousand years has not developed a single food plant compare in importance to the human family with these. If a wise and scientific nation should propose nowadays to add to this list, it would have to form great botanical gardens, and by systematic and long-continued experiments, develop useful plants from the humble productions of the field and forest. Was this done in the past on the island of Atlantis? 10. Why is it that we find in Ptolemy's Geography of Asia Minor, in a list of cities in Armenia Major in A.D. 140, the names of five cities, which have their counterparts in the names of localities in Central America. The Armenian cities are Chal, Kalawa, Zuivana, Cholima, and Zalisa. The Central American localities are Cholula, Kolowakan, Zuivan, Kolama, and Shalisco. Short's North Americans of Antiquity, page 497. 11. How comes it that the sandals upon the feet of the statue of Chachmal, discovered at Chichen Itza, are exact representations of those found on the feet of the Guanches, the early inhabitants of the Canary Islands, whose mummies are occasionally discovered in the eaves of Tenerife? 
Dr. Merritt deems the axe or chisel heads dug up at Chiriqui, Central America, to be almost identical in form as well as material with specimens found in Suffolk County, England. Bancroft's Native Races, Volume 4, page 20. The rock carvings of Chiriqui are pronounced by Mr. Seaman to have a striking resemblance to the ancient incised characters found on the rocks of Northumberland, England. Ibid. Some stones have recently been discovered in Herero and Los Palmos, the Canary Islands, bearing sculptured symbols similar to those found on the shores of Lake Superior. And this has led M. Berthollet, the historiographer of the Canary Islands, to conclude that the first inhabitants of the Canaries and those of the Great West were one in race. Benjamin, the Atlantic Islands, page 130. 12. How comes it that very high authority, Professor Retzius, Smithsonian Report, 1859, page 266, declares, With regard to the primitive dolcecephali of America, I entertain a hypothesis still more bold, namely, that they are nearly related to the Guanches in the Canary Islands, and to the Atlantic populations of Africa, the Moors, Turks, Copts, etc., which Latham comprises under the name of Egyptian Atlantidae. We find one and the same form of skull in the Canary Islands, in front of the African coast, and in the Carib Islands on the opposite coast, which faces Africa. The color of the skin on both sides of the Atlantic is represented in these populations as being of a reddish brown. 13. The barbarians, who are alluded to by Homer and Thucydides, were a race of ancient navigators and pirates called Caries, or Carians, who occupied the isles of Greece before the Pelasgi, and antedated the Phoenicians in the control of the sea. The Abbe Brasseur de Bourbourg claims that these Carians were identical with the Caribs of the West Indies, the Caras of Honduras, and the Guarani of South America. Landa's Relation, pages 52 to 65. 14. When we consider it closely, one of the most extraordinary customs ever known to mankind is that to which I have already alluded in a preceding chapter, to wit, the embalming of the body of the dead man, with a purpose that the body itself may live again in a future state. To arrive at this practice, several things must coexist. A. The people must be highly religious, and possessed of an organized and influential priesthood, to perpetuate so troublesome a custom from age to age. B. They must believe implicitly in the immortality of the soul, and this implies a belief in rewards and punishments after death, in a heaven and a hell. C. They must believe in the immortality of the body, and its resurrection from the grave on some day of judgment in the distant future. D. But a belief in the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body is not enough, for all Christian nations hold to these beliefs. They must supplement these with a determination that the body shall not perish, that the very flesh and blood in which the man died shall rise with him on the last day, and not a merely spiritual body. Now all these four things must coexist before a people proceed to embalm their dead for religious purposes. The probability that all these four things should coexist by accident in several widely separated races is slight indeed. The doctrine of chances is all against it. There is here no common necessity deriving men to the same expedient, with which so many resemblances have been explained. The practice is a religious ceremony, growing out of religious beliefs, by no means common or universal, to wit, that the man who is dead shall live again and live again in the very body in which he died. Not even all the Jews believed in these things. If, then, it should appear that among the races which we claim were descended from Atlantis, this practice of embalming the dead is found, and nowhere else, we have certainly furnished evidence which can only be explained by admitting the existence of Atlantis, and of some great religious race dwelling on Atlantis, who believed in the immortality of soul and body, and who embalmed their dead. We find, as I have shown, first, that the Guanishes of the Canary Islands, 
supposed to be a remnant of the Atlantean population, preserved their dead as mummies. Second, that the Egyptians, the oldest colony of Atlantis, embalmed their dead in such vast multitudes that they are now exported by the ton to England, and ground up into manures to grow English turnips. Third, that the Assyrians, the Ethiopians, the Persians, the Greeks, and even the Romans embalmed their dead. Fourth, on the American continents we find that the Peruvians, the Central Americans, the Mexicans, and some of the Indian tribes follow the same practice. Is it possible to account for this singular custom, reaching through a belt of nations, and completely around the habitable world, without Atlantis? 15. All the traditions of the Mediterranean races look to the ocean as the source of men and gods. Homer sings of Ocean, the origin of gods and mother Tethys. Orpheus says, The fair river of ocean was the first to marry, and he espoused his sister Tethys, who was his mother's daughter. Plato's Dialogues, Cratylus, page 402. The ancients always alluded to the ocean as a river encircling the earth, as in the map of Cosmos. See page 95 and before. Probably a reminiscence of the great canal described by Plato, which surrounded the plain of Atlantis. Homer, in the Iliad, book 18, describes Tethys, the mother goddess, coming to Achilles from the deep abysses of the main. The circling Nereids with their mistress weep, and all the sea-green sisters of the deep. Plato surrounds the great statue of Poseidon in Atlantis with the images of one hundred Nereids. 16. In the deluge legends of the Hindus, as given on page 87 and before, we have seen Manu saving a small fish, which subsequently grew to a great size, and warned him of the coming of the flood. In this legend all the indications point to an ocean as the scene of the catastrophe. It says, At the close of the last Kalpa there was a general destruction, caused by the sleep of Brahma, whence his creatures in different worlds were drowned in a vast ocean. A holy king named Satyavrata then reigned, a servant of the spirit which moved on the waves, Poseidon, and so devout that water was his only sustenance. In seven days the three worlds, remember Poseidon's trident, shall be plunged in an ocean of death. Thou shalt enter the spacious ark, and continue in it secure from the flood on one immense ocean. The sea overwhelmed its shores, deluged the whole earth, augmented by showers from immense clouds. Asiatic Researches, Volume 1, page 230. All this reminds us of the fountains of the great deep, and the floodgates of heaven, and seems to repeat precisely the story of Plato as to the sinking of Atlantis in the ocean. 17. While I do not attach much weight to verbal similarities in the languages of the two continents, nevertheless there are some that are very remarkable. We have seen the Pan and Maya of the Greeks reappearing in the Pan and Maya of the Mayas of Central America. The god of the Welsh triads, Hu the Mighty, is found in the Hunapabu, the hero god of the Quiches, in Hunapu, a hero god and in Huhu-Napu, in Hun-Kam, in hun semi-divine heroes of the Quiches. The Phoenician deity El was subdivided into a number of hypostases called the Balim, secondary divinities, emanating from the substance of the deity. Ancient History, East, Volume 2, page 219. In this word, Balim, we find appearing in the mythology of the Central Americans, applied to the semi-divine progenitors of the human race, Balim Kitsim, Balam Agab, and Ikebalam. End of recording. End of chapter 4. Recording by Mike Harris. Part 3, Chapter 5 of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Atlantis, the Antediluvian World by Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. Section 20. Chapter 5. The Question of Complexion. The tendency of scientific thought in ethnology is in the direction of giving more and more importance to the race characteristics, such as height, color of the hair, eyes, and skin, and the formation of the skull and body generally, than to language. The language possessed by a people may be merely the result of conquest or migration. For instance, in the United States today, white black and red men the descendants of french spanish italians mexicans irish germans scandinavians africans all speak the english language and by the test of language they are all englishmen and yet none of them are connected by birth or descent with the country where that language was developed there is a general misconception as to the color of the european and american races europe is supposed to be peopled exclusively by white men but in reality every shade of color is represented on that continent from the fair complexion of the fairest of the swedes to the dark-skinned inhabitants of the mediterranean coast only a shade lighter than the berbers or moors on the opposite side of that sea tacitus spoke of the quote, black celts end quote. and the term so far as complexion goes might not inappropriately be applied to some of the italians spaniards and portuguese while the basques are represented as of a still darker hue tyler says anthropology page sixty seven quote, on the whole it seems that the distinction of color from the fairest englishman to the darkest african has no hard and fast lines but varies gradually from one tint to another End quote. and when we turn to america we find that the popular opinion that all indians are quote, red men end quote, and of the same hue from from patagonia to hudson's bay is a gross error pritchard says researches into the physical history of mankind volume one page two sixty nine fourth edition eighteen forty one quote, it will be easy to show that the american races show nearly as great a variety in this respect as the nations of the old continent there are among them white races with a florid complexion and tribes black or of a very dark hue that their stature figure and countenance are almost equally diversified End quote. john t short says north americans of antiquity page one eighty nine the menominees sometimes called the white indians formerly occupied the region bordering on lake michigan around green bay the whiteness of these indians which is compared to that of white mulattoes early attracted the attention of the jesuit missionaries and has often been commented on by travelers while it is true that hybridy has done much to lighten the color of many of the tribes still the peculiarity of the complexion of this people has been marked since the first time a european encountered them almost every shade from the ash color of the menominees through the cinnamon red copper and bronze tints may be found among the tribes formerly occupying the territory east of the mississippi until we reach the dark-skinned cause of kansas who are nearly as black as the negro the variety of complexion is as great in south america as among the tribes of the northern part of the continent End quote. in footnote of page one o seven of volume three of u s explorations for a railroad route to the pacific ocean we are told quote, many of the indians of zuni new mexico are white they have a fair skin blue eyes chestnut or auburn hair and are quite good-looking they claim to be full-blooded zunians and have no tradition of intermarriage with any foreign race 
the circumstance creates no surprise among this people for from time immemorial a similar class of people has existed among the tribe End quote. winchell says quote, the ancient indians of california in the latitude of forty degrees were as black as the negroes of guinea while in mexico were tribes of an olive or reddish complexion relatively light among the black races of tropical regions we find generally some light-colored tribes interspersed these sometimes have light hair and blue eyes this is the case with the tuareg of the sahara the afghans of india and the aborigines of the banks of the orinoco and the amazon End quote. winchell's pre-adamites page one eighty five william penn said of the indians of pennsylvania in his letter of august sixteen eighty three quote, the natives are generally tall straight well built and of a singular proportion they tread strong and clever and mostly walk with a lofty chin their eye is little and black not unlike a straight-looked jew i have seen among them as comely european-like faces of both sexes as on your side of the sea and truly an italian complexion hath not much more of the white and the noses of several of them have as much of the roman for their original i am ready to believe them to be of the jewish race i mean of the stock of the ten tribes and that for the following reasons first in the next place i find them to be of the light countenance and their children of so lively a resemblance that a man would think himself in duke's place or berry street in london when he seeth them but this is not all they agree in rites they reckon by moons they offer their first fruits they have a kind of feast of tabernacles they are said to lay their altars upon twelve stones their mourning a year customs of women with many other things that do not now occur End quote. upon this question of complexion catlin in his indians of north america volume one page ninety five etc gives us some curious information we have already seen that the mandans preserved an image of the ark and possessed legends of clearly atlantean character catlin says quote, a stranger in the mandan village is first struck with the different shades of complexion and various colors of hair which he sees in a crowd about him and is at once disposed to exclaim these are not indians there are a great many of these people whose complexions appear as light as half-breeds and among the women particularly there are many whose skins are almost white with the most pleasing symmetry and proportion of feature with hazel with gray and with blue eyes with mildness and sweetness of expression and excessive modesty of demeanor which render them exceedingly pleasing and beautiful why this diversity of complexion i cannot tell nor can they themselves account for it their traditions so far as i can learn them afford us no information of their having had any knowledge of white men before the visit of lewis and clark made to their village thirty-three years ago since that time until now eighteen thirty five there have been very few visits of white men to this place and surely not enough to have changed the complexions and customs of a nation and i recollect perfectly well that governor clark told me before i started for this place that i would find the mandans a strange people and half white among the females may be seen every shade and color of hair that can be seen in our own country except red or auburn which is not to be found there are very many of both sexes and of every age from infancy to manhood and old age with hair of a very bright silvery gray and in some instances almost perfectly white this unaccountable phenomenon is not the result of disease or habit 
but it is unquestionably an hereditary characteristic which runs in families and indicates no inequality in disposition or intellect and by passing this hair through my hands i have found it uniformly to be as coarse and harsh as a horse's mane differing materially from the hair of other colors which among the mandans is generally as fine and soft as silk the stature of the mandans is rather below the ordinary size of man with beautiful symmetry of form and proportion and wonderful suppleness and elasticity end quote. catlin gives us a group fifty four showing this great diversity in complexion one of the figures is painted almost pure white and with light hair the faces are european major james w lind who lived among the dakota indians for nine years and was killed by them in the great outbreak of eighteen sixty two says manuscript history of dakotas library historical society minnesota page forty seven after calling attention to the fact that the different tribes of the sioux nation represent several different degrees of darkness of color quote, the dakota child is of lighter complexion than the young brave this one lighter than the middle-aged man and the middle-aged man lighter than the superannuated homo who by smoke paint dirt and a drying up of the vital juices appears to be the true copper-colored dakota the color of the dakotas varies with the nation and also with the age and condition of the individual it may be set down however as a shade lighter than olive yet it becomes still lighter by change of condition or mode of life and nearly vanishes even in the child under constant ablutions and avoiding of exposure those children in the mission at hazelwood who are taken very young and not allowed to expose themselves lose almost entirely the olive shade and become quite as white as the american child the mandans are as light as the peasants of spain while their brothers the crows are as dark as the arabs dr goodrich in the universal traveller page one fifty four says that the modern peruvians in the warmer regions of peru are as fair as the people of the south of europe End quote. the aymaras the ancient inhabitants of the mountains of peru and bolivia are described as having an olive-brown complexion with regular features large heads and a thoughtful and melancholy cast of countenance they practised in early times the deformation of the skull professor wilson describes the hair of the ancient peruvians as found upon their mummies as quote, a lightish brown and of a fineness of texture which equals that of the anglo-saxon race End quote. Quote, the ancient peruvians says short north americans of antiquity page one eighty seven quote, appear from numerous examples of hair found in their tombs to have been an auburn haired race End quote. garcilaso who had an opportunity of seeing the body of the king viracocha describes the hair of that monarch as snow white haywood tells us of the discovery at the beginning of this century of three mummies in a cave on the south side of the cumberland river tennessee who were buried in baskets as the peruvians were originally buried and whose skin was fair and white and their hair auburn and of a fine texture natural and aboriginal history of tennessee page one ninety one neither is the common opinion correct which asserts all the american indians to be of the same type of features the portraits on this page and on pages one eighty seven and one ninety one taken from the report of the u s survey for a route for a pacific railroad present features very much like those of europeans in fact every face here could be precisely matched among the inhabitants of the southern part of the old continent on the other hand look at the portrait of the great indian orator and reformer savonarola on page one ninety three 
it looks more like the hunting indians of northwestern america than any of the preceding faces in fact if it was dressed with a scalp lock it would pass muster anywhere as a portrait of the quote, man afraid of his horses end quote, or quote, sitting bull end quote. adam was it appears a red man winchell tells us that adam is derived from the red earth the radical letters adam are found in adama quote, something out of which vegetation was made to germinate end quote, to wit the earth adom and adom signify red ruddy bay-coloured as of a horse the colour of a red heifer quote, adam a man a human being male or female red ruddy end quote. pre adamites page one sixty one Quote, the arabs distinguished mankind into two races one red ruddy the other black end quote. ibid they classed themselves among the red men not only was adam a red man but there is evidence that from the highest antiquity red was a sacred color the gods of the ancients were always painted red the wisdom of solomon refers to this custom quote, the carpenter carved it elegantly and formed it by the skill of his understanding and fashioned it to the shape of a man or made it like some vile beast laying it over with vermilion and with paint colouring it red and covering every spot therein End quote. the idols of the indians were also painted red and red was the religious colour lynn's manuscript history of dakotas library historical society minnesota the cushites and ethiopians early branches of the atlantean stock took their name from their quote, sunburned end quote, complexion they were red men the name of the phoenicians signified red himyar the prefix of the himyaritic arabians also means red and the arabs were painted red on the egyptian monuments the ancient egyptians were red men they recognized four races of men the red yellow black and white men they themselves belonged to the rot or red men the yellow men they called namu it included the asiatic races the black men were called nasu and the white men tamhu the following figures are copied from knott and glidden's types of mankind page eighty five and were taken by them from the great works of belzoni champollion and lepsius in later ages so desirous were the egyptians of preserving the aristocratic distinction of the colour of their skin that they represented themselves on the monuments as of a crimson hue an exaggeration of their original race complexion in the same way we find that the ancient aryan writings divided mankind into four races the white red yellow and black the four castes of india were founded upon these distinctions in colour in fact the word for colour in sanskrit varna means caste the red men according to the mahabharata were the kshatriyas the warrior caste who were afterward engaged in a fierce contest with the whites the brahmans and were nearly exterminated although some of them survived and from their stock buddha was born so that not only the mohammedan and christian but the buddhistic religion seems to be derived from the branches of the hamitic or red stock the great manu was also of the red race the egyptians while they painted themselves red-brown represented the nations of palestine as yellow-brown and the libyans as yellow-white the present inhabitants of egypt range from a yellow colour in the north parts to a deep bronze tyler is of opinion anthropology page ninety five 
that the ancient egyptians belonged to a brown race which embraced the nubian tribes and to some extent the berbers of algiers and tunis he groups the assyrians phoenicians persians greeks romans and Illusions, bretons dark welshmen and people of the caucasus into one body and designates them as quote, dark whites end quote. the himyarite arabs as i have shown derived their name originally from their red color and they were constantly depicted on the egyptian monuments as red or light brown herodotus tells us that there was a nation of libyans called the maxians who claimed descent from the people of troy the walls of troy we shall see were built by poseidon that is to say troy was an atlantean colony these maxians painted their whole bodies red the zavesians the ancestors of the zuavas of algiers the tribe that gave their name to the french zouaves also painted themselves red some of the ethiopians were quote, copper colored end quote. american cyclopedia article egypt page four sixty four tyler says anthropology page one sixty the language of the ancient egyptians though it cannot be classed in the semitic family with hebrew has some important points of correspondence whether due to the long intercourse between the two races in egypt or to some deeper ancestral connection and such analogies also appear in the berber languages of north africa end quote. these last were called by the ancients the atlanteans quote, if a congregation of twelve representatives from malacca china japan mongolia sandwich islands chile peru brazil chickasaws comanches etc were dressed alike or undressed and unshaven the most skilful anatomist could not from their appearance separate them End quote. fontaine's how the world was peopled pages one forty seven two forty four ferdinand columbus in his relation of his father's voyages compares the inhabitants of guanani to the canary islanders an atlantean race and describes the inhabitants of san domingo as still more beautiful and fair in peru the charanzanis studied by monsieur Ancrod, also resemble the canary islanders l'abbe brasseur de bourbourg imagined himself surrounded by arabs when all his indians of rabinal were around him for they had he said their complexion features and beard pierre martyr speaks of the indians of the parian gulf as having fair hair the human species page two o one the same author believes that tribes belonging to the semitic type are also found in america he refers to quote, certain traditions of guiana and the use in the country of a weapon entirely characteristic of the ancient canary islanders End quote. when science is able to disabuse itself of the mortonian theory that the aborigines of america are all red men and all belong to one race we may hope that the confluence upon the continent of widely different races from different countries may come to be recognized and intelligently studied there can be no doubt that red white black and yellow men have united to form the original population of america and there can be as little doubt that the entire population of europe and the south shore of the mediterranean is a mongrel race a combination in varying proportions of a dark brown or red race with a white race the characteristics of the different nations depending upon the proportions in which the dark and light races are mingled for peculiar mental and moral characteristics go with these complexions the red-haired people are a distinct variety of the white stock there were once whole tribes and nations with this color of hair 
their blood is now intermingled with all the races of men from palestine to iceland everything in europe speaks of vast periods of time and long continued and constant interfusion of bloods until there is not a fair-skinned man on the continent that has not the blood of the dark-haired race in his veins nor scarcely a dark-skinned man that is not lighter in hue from intermixture with the white stock end of part three chapter five end of section twenty